Hello, I'm Katie Steckles. And I'm Peter Ollett. Katie, what's today's mathematical object? Well, today's object is an acoustic mirror, um, which is a slightly interesting idea because mirrors, as far as I'm aware, are, are for reflecting light, and that's not what acoustic means. But it's OK, because we've got someone here who knows a bit about acoustic mirrors who's going to come and tell us about it. Uh, welcome, James Grime. Hey, everyone. Hi, Katie. Hi, Peter. Hello. Hello. So uh, what, what's an acoustic mirror? Oh, man, this is so great. So I, I've, I only just learnt about this. Someone told me about this and I just loved it. Uh, so, I mean, I'm going to set it up this way. So if you go, if you go for a walk down the, you know, the south coast of England or possibly in the, on the Yorkshire coast of England, you might come across a, a rather strange object. It's a, it's a massive slab of concrete and when I say massive I mean it's five meters high so imagine right twice the height of a person and then some so this massive thick sheet of concrete and in that block of concrete it looks like there's a, a kind of a hollow kind of a, a spherical dimple in that uh, concrete and it's a very odd object this is what is called an, an acoustic mirror and it's from World War II and the idea is these were part of an early warning system. The idea was they could detect the sound of an enemy aircraft's engines. So from an enemy aircraft's engines, that sound would hit these things that are acoustic mirrors. It would pick up the sound. It would reflect the sound and focus it onto a point. And at that point, you would have a microphone or something. And that is your early warning system. There are a handful of these built around the UK, and this is a completely sort of unique thing to the UK. There's apparently there's one in Malta, and apart from that, uh, this is the only place that ever did it. Wow, and I'm, I'm genuinely thinking, like, can I plan a hike at some point in the future that will take me near one of these? Because this sounds incredible that these just these gigantic things there. So it's like what, like a almost like a satellite dish, I guess, that it it sort of focuses things in. It's exactly like a satellite disk. It's the same principle as uh, a satellite disk. So the shape that they are, uh, it's called a parabolic dish. And that's what a satellite dish is well. And that's a unique mathematical shape because it will focus, uh, say, rays of light for your or radio waves, if it was a satellite dish, onto a point. So parabolic dish is what it sounds like. It's, um, it's made from the shape of parabola. Uh, you might know a parabola. A parabola is the shape of throwing a ball in the air. So that's the arc of a ball in the air. Yeah, my, my maths brain is saying minus x squared <laughs> for, a, for a graph of a ball. Yeah. <laughs> x squared, exactly. So x squared or um, so x squared scaled up, perhaps. You know, that's absolutely true. Uh, but another way you could define uh, a parabola is if you imagine drawing a horizontal line and then draw a point above that line so that's what we've got a horizontal line and then a point above that line then a parabola is made of all the points that are an equal distance from the line and the point so if that makes sense the point that i put above the horizontal line is your focus point and all the points that are equally distant makes this curved parabola shape. A consequence of that rather strange definition is that that focal point is on the line of reflection, of every line of reflection. So imagine if you make, let's make it out of wood or something. You make one of these curves out of wood. And if you dropped a ball on it, that ball would bounce off the curve and it would always pass through uh, this focus point. Yeah. So the kind of halfway between thing, I've I've definitely seen people do a thing where you get a piece of paper and you fold like points on the paper into a, all into the same point and that you end up with a, a set of folds that form a kind of parabola curve. Yeah, this is absolutely true. This is really great. Again, this is only something I discovered recently. Get a post-it note, get like a little square post-it note, draw, put a dot on it halfway across, put a little dot and then fold up the bottom edge so that it meets that dot. And 
fold it up, do it many times at different points along that bottom edge so that they meet that point you've drawn and then that will make creases. You've got a whole bunch of creases now in, in, in your post-it note and you'll notice that those creases, the more you do, will start to make your curve and that curve is a parabola. So you, imagine if I put like a little bell where the focus <laughs> point was, you go yeah. ping, ping, and I could yeah. drop the ball and I'm dropping it vertically. So you drop the ball vertically onto the curve, ping, and it would hit that bell every time. Yeah, so the, the lines coming in have to be kind of perpendicular, I guess, to the surface at the bottom that you're thinking about. Yeah, that's part of the definition of a parabola. So when you're dropping this ball, or if it's radio waves for a satellite dish, light waves for a parabolic mirror, it is absolutely dead on, hitting straight on uh, your curve. So it seems very clear that if you drop it right above the focal point, it'll go pass through the focal point, bounce and come back up through the focal point again. But what we're saying is that if, if you put a line uh, parallel with that anywhere, it hits anywhere on the mirror. If it goes to the right of the focal point, it'll bounce towards the focal point. If it goes to the left, it'll bounce towards the focal point. Very cool. OK, so the parabola curve is, is a, a sort of single line on a page. So how do you translate that into a 3D dish? Yeah, well, that's, that's actually fairly simple. Imagine I took that curve and then I just spin it around at its midpoint, around its line of symmetry, just make a spin. And if you imagine it's spinning around, it starts to make a, a kind of a dish and that's your parabolic dish. So if I slice that dish through the center at any angle, then that cross section is also going to be a, a parabola. So I guess you've got this shape that lets you kind of focus things in. So presumably, I guess someone's just realized that this would be a way to collect sound, I guess, from, from far away. Like, whose idea was that? Like, what happened? Yeah, this, this is something that goes way back. It's one of those ancient Greek things. So it was uh, Diocles who came up with this. And he actually was using this property. He was interested in this property of focusing onto a point. And not only did he work out the maths and prove the maths of it, he then built a, a reflective mirror which he called a burning mirror. So it would reflect the sunlight onto a focus point so that you could, you know, set fires. In fact, that's what they do now with the Olympic flame. When they set the Olympic flame in Greece and they start off on its, on its run around the world, um, they use one of these reflecting mirrors and it's a parabolic dish focusing the light onto the Olympic torch. Cool, so I guess if you're reflecting light, you need a mirror, like an actual mirror. So if you're reflecting sound, probably concrete is good, right? You just need something that's that's very different to the like the air. I guess something that will reflect sound could just be any hard surface. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, the, the principles are the same. I mean, the, the idea that focusing light onto a point was you know, a brilliant idea. And it's like the, it began the, the study of optics. Uh, so things that we use now, lenses and... All the things that we use now are so important. Telescopes. Um, so it was um, a Scottish astronomer, mathematician, uh, James Gregory, who first designed a telescope. This is in the 17th century, which used a parabolic mirror to then focus the light onto a point so that you could see you know, images further away. Uh, so yeah, hugely important. So it's used in telescopes. It's used to collect radio signals onto a single point, like I said, satellite dishes and uh, parabolic microphones are a thing. So again, it's just the same idea, same principle. A parabolic microphone is, again, this dish, and you can pick up the sound from so on far away. And they use this. This is something that people use. They use them at sporting events. Like, you know, if you want to pick up the footballers having a private conversation somewhere far away. So you can point this dish in their direction, it picks up the sound coming from them. They use it in wildlife documentaries, things like that. And and like it sounds, it, you use it in surveillance. So, so yeah. spy films. Yeah, it? I've definitely <laughs> seen James Bond use one of these. Like I've, it's, I think it's Sean Connery, and he's on a rooftop, and he's looking at a person in a building across the way, and he's got like a parabolic mic that's listening to what they're saying. I think. And the other little curious thing about it is, you can use that principle completely in reverse. So what I've been describing is picking up and focusing light coming at the dish. 
and it focuses onto a focal point. If I put that in reverse and instead put a light source at the focal point, then that light uh, radiates out, hits the dish, and then that light is reflected in a beam that goes in parallel outwards from the dish. And it makes this beam of light. That's what car headlights are. Yeah. So it has a light source in at the focal point of a parabolic dish and it creates this strong beam of light. Yeah, I think in like in theatres when they have the big lights at the top of the theatre, they're called parkans. Like that's the kind of industry term for them. And I think it's parabolic reflector cans, I guess. Like it's par, P-A-R for parabolic. Uh, so they must be using that kind of thing. And I, I guess you could sort of, combine those because I'm I'm thinking about this like there's a park down the road from my house genuinely where they've installed as a fun thing for kids to play with two parabolic dishes facing each other um, and I guess the idea of this is that if you go and stand at the focal point of one of them and say something into the dish it will kind of reflect that out as a series of parallel sound waves beam it across to the other one which is presumably in exactly the right spot uh, catch all of those things and put it into the focal point of that other one and if someone else is stood there you can hear the other person saying something that doesn't even have to be that loud I guess that you, you know you would just get a very clear version of that and they've got some at Jodrell Bank as well I think they've got these big green metal ones that you can go there's like little steps that you walk up to stand in the right spot to be in the in the focal point of the thing and you know you're in the way a little bit but not enough to ruin it I guess. Yeah, it's so cool. And I think I've heard those called whisper, whisper dishes or something like that, uh, which is very descriptive of what it is. It's such a such a fun, cool idea. So back at the start, you told us about these ones that are sort of buried in cliff faces around the edge of the country. How did that happen? Who made those? This was something that uh, people were experimenting with at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so there was... Uh, uh, an acoustic physicist, I don't know if that's the correct word, a sound physicist, who had been working on this already for, you know, World War One, so the between war years. And so he had been put in charge of this project of this early warning system. And so he started to construct at different locations, started to construct these big concrete slabs, like I say, to focus the sound of enemy aircraft. However, in the end, the whole thing was cancelled because what it gave you, because of the speed of aircraft at that time and the improvement in the speed of aircraft at that time, what this early warning system gave you was a um, 10 minute warning. 10 minute warning and, and, then, and then they were just you know too close, right? And that uh, is an improvement over just not having an acoustic mirror and looking out your window and that would give you a five minute warning so after all that effort you get an extra five minutes right which is just just not good enough and then really the whole thing was supplanted when they invented radar oh what there's always one isn't there just <laughs> oh ruin everything so is, is that to do with like the speed of sound relative to the speed of a plane i guess yeah exactly exactly so I mean, the difference between the speed of the sound and the speed of the planes was just not big enough. However, radar, a completely different principle where you fire your radio signals out there so that it hits the plane, reflects back and gets detected back at the radar station, uh, gives you much greater warning. Mm. But not all is lost because there was one good outcome from the uh, acoustic mirror project which was they'd worked out the most or the best uh, place to put these acoustic mirrors, right? The, the most efficient, you know, useful places to put these mirrors. And that gave them a great advantage when radar came along because it told them where exactly where to put the radar stations. Oh, so actually yeah. it gave the radar project a head start. So that research into where to put that early warning system was used by the radar team after the war and that did give us an advantage and that gave us an advantage over the German radar system. Uh, so the you know, Germany had the radar system as well but hadn't worked out the most efficient place to put their stations which is why the British radar system was more successful 
than the German radar system. Cool. So thank you very much, James, for coming and sharing that stuff. It's all very cool, isn't it? It's just so much cool stuff. Um, so if people wanted to find out more about you or this, uh, how can people find you on the internet? Well, to find me on the internet, I guess Twitter at James Grime. I'm on YouTube. My own channel is Singing Banana. Of course it is. Why isn't it? And <laughs> the other channel you'll see me pop up on, though, is the Number File channel, which is a very popular channel about little maths nuggets, kind of like this. And yes, if you want to find out more about these acoustic mirrors, search for this term because there are a couple of very dedicated websites. This is such a niche thing. There are a couple of very dedicated websites that will tell you exactly where to find these mirrors for yourself. Fantastic. Uh, so we are also on Twitter. I am at Stex. And I'm at Peter Ola and the podcast itself is at Maths Objects. And both Peter and I blog at a website called The A Periodical, which is at aperiodical.com and is also where you can find more episodes of this podcast. If you'd like to get in touch and suggest any objects or talk to us about acoustic mirrors and sound bouncing around, then you can contact us at objects at aperiodical.com. The music is Funk Game Loop by Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. Thank you.